Welcome to Ladies Talking Leafs. I'm Chris. And I'm Syl. And just like Austin Matthews and William Needland are hitting milestones this season, we are hitting our own milestone uh, with this being our our 100th episode. Woohoo! And we have a great, fantastic show coming up. Uh, and it's a great time of year for hockey fans with the NHL playoffs starting this weekend coming on April 20th. Yes. And another awesome thing is that we're going to be going weekly during the playoffs and we are listening to you because a lot of you asked for that last year. So we'll be publishing episodes on a weekly basis and within a day of recording so that we can be right on top of everything for you guys. <laughs> Anyways, you will be also seeing more uh, new content from us as well that we are calling LTL Quick Hits which will be exactly that, a short episode with our takes on what is going on with the team at that time. So look for us on the Believe Network and please hit that follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to us and you won't miss any of our episodes. If you watch us on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button and you'll also see our video content for play from playoff games that we attend. All right. So a bit of business here, just to let you know, Bet Online is our, is your number one sp- source for all your spring and summer sports this season from the NHL and NBA playoff stats, MLB and golf. All the latest stats, news and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website betonline.ag today or use your mobile device to get in on the action bet online where the game starts please gamble responsibly if you or someone you know needs support or advice reach out to connex ontario or an organization near you place your limits and stay within it all right so let's get into our 100th episode now and we are excited to have two guest interviews for our 100th show First, we welcome journalist and author Damian Cox to the show to talk Leafs and the upcoming playoffs. And then we have former Leaf and current pro scout for the NHL's LA Kings, Mark Osborne, joining us to give us his thoughts on the Leafs. So without any further ado, let's talk Leafs. So we're getting closer to Pup puck drop on the 2024 NHL playoffs and we're waiting to find out who the Leafs are going to play. Um, to talk about this and thoughts on the Leafs going into the playoffs, we welcome to the show Toronto Star columnist and broadcaster Damian Cox. So Damian is also author of several books on the Leafs and the NHL, including his latest called Revival, The Chaotic Colorful Journey of the 1997-78 Oh, so 1977-78, sorry, Toronto Maple Leafs, which he has co-authored with Gord Stellick. Uh, thanks for coming on the show with us again, Damien. Well, it's it's nice to talk to you guys again. And I generally refer to him as the Gord Stellick. Just the Gord have, Stellick. <laughs> okay. If there's any, you know, confusion with all the other Gord Stellicks out there. But uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's nice yeah. to see you guys again. You've made it through another season and now you're ready for the heartbreak or euphoria of the playoffs all right absolutely yes no no heartbreak so (laughs) (laughs) well let's get into it starting off with the amazing season that uh, superstar austin matthews is having recently you wrote an article on on matthews where you wrote that matthews is the most prolific prolific offensive player in history of the franchise and the last time we saw something like this over the over several seasons what the Leafs were a defensive team with Pat Burns or under Mm -hmm. Pat Burns so do you think do you think the fans are appreciating what we're seeing with Austin Matthews or is there still there's always this talk about oh yeah but what does he do in the playoffs kind of thing Right. right but yeah, we just wanted to get your thoughts on that. You know, it's a great question, and it has to do with, you know, when Doug Gilmore had his amazing season back in uh, 90, the 92-93 season, or when Daryl Sittler had his great season, his 10-point night and all that stuff back then. I guess that would have been the 76-77 season. Or anyway, you know, th- those kinds of questions didn't surround those guys at that time. And... Sittler hadn't really done a whole lot in the playoffs, and Gilmore had, but not in Toronto. So um, I guess what this is is a function of the fact that, you know, people aren't appreciative enough of the fact that this is now a team that's made the playoffs eight years in a row. I feel like saying, when I hear that, I feel like saying, 
do you guys realize what happened before this? Like all those years before this? And I feel like they're not as appreciative of this superstar player that is suddenly in their midst. You know, if, you know, and, and, and some people, they, they'd like him to be more like Wendell Clark. I see the jersey behind you there. More like Wendell Clark and drop his gloves or, you know, or as you say, have had a uh, history of playoff success. And, you know, I sort of get that and I sort of don't because, let's face it, we watch these guys every year from October to April. And this is a pretty entertaining team with a lot of outstanding players. And then we watch them for at the very end. And yeah, I understand why people would love them to be successful. I'd like to see them tell a different story. But I don't think uh, a great player who does great things in the regular season um, is, no, is not a great player because his team does not do well in the playoffs. If you think that way, then you have to, then we better all go down and take Marcel Dion out of the Hockey Hall of Fame and say, no, he wasn't any good. You know, I mean, it's it's a team game with a focus on individual stars. And, uh, no, I really – I just don't get the feeling. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Do you think there's enough appreciation out there for Austin Matthews? No, I don't because I just – I remember back, obviously, with Doug Gilmore too. But that was just – that was the whole – team I guess in some ways mm-hmm. but uh, when Gilmore got his assists and like his assists record and the points record but going back to Rick Vive in the 80s yep. with that 50 with the 50 goal seasons everything was focused on Rick I mean the teams weren't doing well obviously during the regular season too much then and it was like a totally different time but just so much focus on that on him getting 50 goals and celebrating him the fans were just in love with Rick Vive all like all the time. And um, when he was scoring those, those, those 50 goal seasons, but um, so I kind of compare it to that. And I just think I just hear too much of this. It's all about the playoffs kind of thing. Mm-hmm. We know it is all about the playoffs. It's all about getting the Stanley cup, but yeah. I have a question actually, since you are a media man, um, how much of a like an effect do you think the the different media landscape has on that? Because like I remember, you know, especially if you're looking at that Dougie Wendell ninety three run, like the newspapers, like it was front page all the time. And now that it's uh, and like, like we had like our cubicles at work were like covered with yeah. you know you know <laughs> clip outs from the paper and stuff like that, you know, like and so the fact that it's all online, a lot of the media comes direct from the source, you know, from the team. Do you think that has a, an effect on the way it's kind of, you know, hyped or consumed or? Well, I mean, the media world compared to 92 is so different. Totally. I mean, it, it's not even, it's not even the same ball game at all. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Then you had columnists in town. This was before I became a columnist back in 92, you know, for all four newspapers that, you know, could change opinion in the city by whatever they wrote in, in, in the paper. That's no longer the case. Uh, it's changed dramatically in that way. Um, there's a diffusion of interest. There's more teams, um, you know, um, and the lack of success of the Leafs since then has allowed people, I think, to become fans of other teams. Heck, you'll find... Vegas Golden Knights fans at, at Leaf games now. So there's been kind of a, a, a diffusion of the interest in general. And I, I think the other thing that's true um, is um, Austin Matthews is an American. He's not a Canadian mm-hmm. like good old that's Dougie true. Gilmore or good old Wendell Clark or good old Daryl Sittler. And even the fact that, I mean, the other night he passed Dave Keon for the most goals um, in team history. Well, you know, Dave Keon played at a time basically when the league was all Canadians. You know, there were no European, very few Americans, and very few teams. Um, now we live in a world in which there are players from all over the world, um, lots of Americans, uh, lots of Canadians still, obviously. And, you know, Austin Matthews has to swim in that sort of very different fish tank than than guys like Keon did or even guys like Daryl Sittler is. So... I think comparing it's like comparing eras in hockey, you know, mm. comparing Maurice Richard with Connor McDavid. You can't really. You really you really can't. 
it's so different. And comparing media uh, environments from now versus 92, 93, hey, you guys weren't around. So how good could it have been back then? (laughs) This podcast wasn't around. Just so true, so true. true. To keep people informed and break news. So how good could it have been back then? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's move on to the playoff picture here then. Um, we The big question we have about the playoffs right now is the Leafs' defense. So Brad Treliving commented before and during the season that the blue line is an area that he wanted to strengthen. Um, do you think that he has done enough on the D to take the Leafs on a long playoff run? <laughs> okay, next no. question. Would you like no, to elaborate? <laughs> but you know what? I don't. I don't think that they did. Um, but the, what was there to do? <laughs> you know, like who could you get? I, yeah. I don't think uh, I don't think Alex Peter Angelo was available or Kale McCarr or any of those guys. Like, who are you going to get that was going to make this bed was made last summer? The other thing was when you go back to the Leafs losing in the playoffs last year to Florida. Why did they lose? Couldn't score. Yeah, they couldn't score. Yeah. Couldn't score. And we see this every year, and you'll hear the same nonsense if things don't go well again. They're not tough enough. You know, their defense isn't good enough. And I can almost guarantee you, if they aren't able to beat Florida, it'll be because they couldn't score. Um, Or, you know, and maybe they don't get significant or good enough goaltending. And they kind of go hand in hand, right? If your goaltending's, eh, you better score some goals. So while I don't think, I think he did what he could with the defense. You know, like I say, who went out and got a player that really changed their defense? Maybe you could argue with Noah Hannafin going to Vegas. You know, maybe, you know, depending. Um, So I think it's going to come down to, you know, whether they've got enough offense. And I really think in a lot of ways another attacker would have, you know, another goal scorer would have made a lot more sense. But all year, this has been a team that scored lots of goals, and now it's up to the big three or the big four, and we'll see if they can come through and score some more goals. So you think really the it's probably the goaltending then that on the defensive side the that might might be the bigger question? Yeah, yeah. It's always the goaltending, right? I mean, yeah. Samsonov outplays Vasilevsky in the first round last year, and the Leafs win. But as mm-hmm. Vas- as Samsonov gets hurt. Sergei Bobrovsky plays like Turk Rota, and <laughs> Florida wins in five. Mm-hmm. And then by the time they get to the final, Bobrovsky is playing like, you know, Turk Broda's chubby brother, Alf, and can't stop anything anymore. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Florida doesn't win. I mean, it's, it's really not complicated, but figuring out who's going to be the goalie, who's going to play well enough to get through. I think you're going to see both uh, Joseph Wall and... Uh, Samsonov in the in the postseason. Who knows? At this yeah. rate, we may see Matt Murray as well. I know that's that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Eh? yeah. <laughs> All right. So Man. let's move on then to to Sheldon Keefe. Actually, um, we can say that well, we most people have been saying that he was out coached a, a few times the last few playoffs um, with John Cooper and Paul Maurice both making the right adjustments in the past to beat the Leafs uh, in the playoffs. And Keefe's been a little bit different with his approach this season with the team, whether or not that's because he has a new general manager and it's not his buddy there, Kyle Dubas, that's, uh, that's, that's with him. But um, do you think this will make a difference in the playoffs? Like the way he's kind of changing his approach with um, like the roster and how like Mitch Marner isn't tied to Austin Matthews. Let's just say now, like if he decides to keep Domi, um, with Bertuzzi and Austin Matthews as a line, do you think like stuff like that will make a difference? Um, it better make a difference, right? Yeah. I mean, it better <laughs> make a difference. Now yeah. let's let's we'll put all our cards on the table. I thought they should have replaced him last uh, spring, and mm. I thought that they should have replaced him partway through this season. Uh, the one thing you'll never hear is very rarely is to me, anyways. You, you never, almost never hear, boy, those Leafs, they are a well coached team. Now, to be fair to Keith, um, he's been gathering experience, and he can only deal with the players he's got in front of him. And while I, I like last year's Leaf team better than this year's Leaf team, I kind of like this group to play Florida better mm-hmm. than last year's group because 
we know the referees are going to play or call their usual garbage uh, games in the playoffs, and they're going to let them know. I mean, who can remember Steve Stamkos running around cross checking everybody and then mugging Austin Matthews and no, you know, no power plays. I mean, and and the stuff that Matthew Kachuk got away and Sam Bennett got away with in the playoffs. So I think this group, assuming it's going to be Florida, this group is I think might be better set up to take on Florida. So to me, that means if Keith can't get it done with this group, I'm not sure what the argument is for keeping him. I really don't know what it would be, uh, uh, you know, other than continuity. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what the discussion would be saying, oh, this is the right guy. Now, that would then lead you to, okay, if, you, if it's not going to be him, then who's it going to be? Um, and that's another argument. Yeah, entirely. but <laughs> I, you know, look, I, I think you know he's done a good job this year. I think they did a great job with Samson in his mid-season crisis. I think they've mm-hmm. done a good job, you know, uh, in navigating lots of different little problems, integrating some other guys into the lineup who have been, you know, pretty pretty useful. Max Domi, I think, is a guy who has taken an entire season really to figure out where he fits. So I think you give the coach credit for that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a, it's a win lose game and the coach got to win. Yeah. And you, so you think, I guess, regardless of the fact that the, his new contract takes effect next year, I guess, cause Trilliving extended him for another, it's a two year contract, I think. So I guess MLSE has deep pockets. So yeah. if it doesn't work out, they'll probably, you think it's from your opinion, you'd say to, as long as they don't get past the first or if they don't get past the first round, definitely. But do they have to go a certain number of rounds in your opinion? Like to, well, I, I think we always have to be careful um, um, saying what's gonna, what has to happen after a okay. season for, yeah. for a couple of reasons. One, the Toronto Maple Leafs are part of this gigantic sports corporation and they make a zillion dollars. And what we think is success for them may be very different what they think is success. Um, you know, selling all the tickets, having another 100-point season, marketing all their players, doing all those things, that, that's a lot. Like, that's a business they're running. We look at it often as fans. They look at it as business. And, and also, they have to exist within the National Hockey League. So last year when people say, okay, they've got to tear up that core, and I say, okay, you're gonna, you're, let's say you're going to trade Mitch Marner. Who are you going to get? Who are you going to get that's going to make your team better? This is not you know 1999 where you can spend as much money as you want and bring in three more guys and keep the ones you got. So you have to say these things in in a real world. So I mean, I would make a change, but I would have made a change before now. Um, right. What MLSE will do, I don't think you know his contract will be the decider. But on the other hand, look, we saw teams like Nashville. You know, David Poyle kept Barry Trotz on for years and years and years, even when Nashville didn't have playoff success. There is always an argument to be made for stability and continuity. And I think that it, those are themes that should resonate with Leaf fans because for so long there was no stability and there was no continuity. So if that, if that ends up being their decision... Look, if you're Brad Trilliving and you and you lose in the first round and you say I'm keeping Sheldon Keith, what's the downside? <laughs> like, what are they going to fire you? No. Are the fans not going to show up? Oh, no, they're going to show up. Is the TV contract going to shrink? Are the price, you know, the the ticket price is going to go down? There's no negative, other than you'll get a bunch of people going, oh, I can't believe it. Well, there's always a bunch of people saying they can't believe something or other with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's definitely true. And and now we're actually going moving away from the ice a little bit. And you sort of touched on it a little bit because MLSE is this huge behemoth co- corporation and they just hired a new CEO, mm-hmm. Keith Pelly, who you may have crossed path, paths with in, in, the, in the past. Um, can you give your thoughts on on what kind of impact you think he may have on the organization and then also yeah. on the Leafs? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably a little biased because Keith's a friend of mine. He used to live oh. just up <laughs> the road over there. There's a, bar just, there's a bar just over here, which is where he signed me 
away from TSN and I joined Sportsnet. So uh, we have. <laughs> so a you're the right guy to talk to about him then. <laughs> we, That's we real inside info. <laughs> we go back a long, long way. Mm. And I've known Keith and I've worked with Keith. Um, and I've been amazed by Keith as he's charted this pretty extraordinary path through, um, you know, sports, international sports, and now mm-hmm. he's back here. Um, now, all that said, I don't I imagine he's going to come in here and rip everything up, fire Brendan Shanahan, you know, change the color of the uniforms to, to, to yellow or, you know, I, I just don't think he's done that. You go back in his history when he was with the Toronto Argonauts, he got on. He got on the streets. He literally went house to house selling tickets. That was a very different kind of thing. When he went to when he was at Sportsnet and TSN, he did. Um, you know, came up with a lot of different ideas. Some of which worked. Some of which didn't work. Um, he might put down hiring me was one of the ones that didn't work. But I'll leave that to him to talk, discuss it another time. Um, when he went to the European golf tour, did spend a lot of time really trying to develop new narratives, uh, try to develop stars. And then he got caught up in the whirlwind of this whole PGA live fight. So um, now he comes to this situation, gigantically successful company, basketball team. Uh, and let's forget, it's not just the Leafs he's having to be president of. Um, uh, soccer team, uh, and he may come in and say, the Leafs are the least of my problems. I've got other stuff I want to work on. But I think where he will get involved for sure is in, what is it, two years now left on this current deal, Rogers with the NHL. And mm-hmm. what the new, he was the guy who flew down to um, New York and negotiated that deal with Gary Bettman. And I, I really wonder at some point if the Leafs are going to say, why do we want to be tied to um, some deal like this? Why can't we have more autonomy? For example, and it's not an exact comparison, in U.S. college football, the University of Notre Dame has their own television package, um, entirely unique. Maybe, maybe that's what Keith Pelly will be demanding. So I would suspect short-term Lee fans would in, should anticipate that his impact is going to be on the business side. Of, of what the Leafs are doing and on the, and probably particularly on the television side because there's going to be a lot happening on that over the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely. So, Chris, anything that was else? a long answer, eh? Yeah, I know, but really <laughs> thorough and exactly yeah. what we're looking for. So that's awesome. Yeah. Anyway. And we didn't know that. We, didn't, we had no idea that you, no, we had no he idea. was living, living just down the road from you. So. Yeah, he was. I don't know where he's living now. Uh, yeah. That's, and that's I, I saw him about uh, a year and a half ago. I was playing, went over to your, uh, England playing golf with some buddies. And then I went down and played with him at his course at Wentworth, which is like, whoa. <laughs> like, I would, didn't even think they let people like me into places like that. <laughs> and we played there. And you, he, I mean, at that point, he was really on top of the world. And now to come back to Toronto with a job like this, I, I think he probably feels like he's on top of the world again. It's exciting for him. Yeah. Well, we're exciting to see um, because I know that he is a very creative guy. Uh, he thinks outside the box, and I kind of feel like the Leafs are, are, you know, an organization so entrenched in tradition. It's it's really easy for such a big company to be in a pretty small box, you know, not you know want to venture too far outside of of what traditionally has been laid out. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see what he will do in the future. So Damien, thanks so much for being on with us and coming on with us as a guest again. And we promise we will not wait so long to invite you on again. Who are the other 98 people? <laughs> um, we haven't had that many guests no. actually, but <laughs> we're working but, um, on it. Hey, yeah, we're working doing, on you guys, it. You guys are doing super. And, uh, I, I tell you of all the media out there and stuff, I always get the sense you guys at least you have the the pulse of the people. There's a, a lot of stuff going on that has changed the media uh, universe in the past number of years, and I think you guys are making a, con- a good contribution. So keep going. 
Thank you. Right, thank, thank you so you. much. We appreciate that feedback. Yeah. And, and yes, we do try to keep our pulse on Leafs Nation. So everyone, you can check out Damien's articles in the Toronto Star and also visit his website, damospin.ca, where you can find out more about uh, his books that he has authored with, of course, also the Gord Stellick as well. The, <laughs> the Gord Stellick. <laughs> so you can find the link to all of that in our show notes. Thanks. Thanks again, Damien. We will Damian. talk to you again soon. Thank you. So once again, we want to thank Damien Cox for coming on the show. He always has interesting and sometimes a little bit controversial takes on the Leafs, um, but it's all fun and, and good. And I did sense actually a bit of positivity this time from his comments. So that's a good, that's a good thing. Somehow there was, uh, I know he wasn't too big on the, on the defense, but uh <laughs> But somehow I, I've, I, I got a, I got a positive thing to say that, uh, yeah. things might go well this year or Sheldon Keefe either for that matter. Yes. But yeah. anyway, uh, Damien is a wealth of knowledge. He knows his leaves. He knows the leaves history, you know, being a journalist in this, in this market for so long, you know, he has, um, just such a broad scope and perspective on, on the leaves and the business of MLSE in the NHL. So now we're going to go and uh, move on to our next guest, Leaf, Leafs alumnus Mark Osborne. Uh, we get his thoughts on the Leafs and his perspectives as a former player. So it's our 100th episode of the podcast, and we are honored to have with us former Leaf and current pro scout for the LA Kings, Mark Osborne. So we know Mark from his playing days as a Leaf, of course, and he was with the Leafs for eight seasons in two separate stints from the 1986-87 season to 90-91, and then returned to the Leafs for three seasons from 91-92 to 93-94. He played over 900 NHL games, and many fans also know him from his time as an analyst on Leafs TV, and of course, doing the post-game show on the fan with Gord Stellick. So welcome to the show show mark we are so honored Welcome. to have you on well you know what? it's great to be with you girls and when i got that email and i go two girls that are into the leafs having their <laughs> own little show yeah. i said no problem i'm in because i uh <laughs> i'm one that has two girls and i'm in a in a house full of women so mm -hmm. uh this is great this is great for me <laughs> wow fantastic yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, let's start off, first of all, by getting your thoughts on Austin Matthews and the season he's having with 69 goals now, one away. So you were Gary Lehman's line mate uh, when mm. he had his 50 goal season right. and with the Leafs. And you were also played with Doug Gilmore when he was achieving the Leafs single season franchise records for points and assists. So the question we have, I guess a lot of fans say it's all about the playoffs, but which is understandable. But as a teammate, can you tell us how it feels as a player, I guess, and the team as a whole to be part of like regular season franchise records like that? Yeah, it it uh, it obviously is still a special thing. And, and you mentioned, uh, you know, Chris, that the playoffs are the ultimate. I mean, that's where you're really judged by, uh, you know, your career achievements in, in some regards. But, you know, there's no question what Austin is doing right now um is is fantastic it's exciting um i remember scouting austin when he was just getting into the league because i've been with the kings now for nine years so you were able to recognize what everybody was talking about this uh guy that can score big strong and powerful and i'm not going to take credit for this but i did write in some of my earlier reports that he will be the rocket richard winner one day <laughs> And um, but nobody, I think, would have been imagined in the post lockout era or the new lock, you know, the new era that we're in with the cap um, that somebody could accomplish what I think the last person would have done. It would have been I don't even know who would have done 70 goals the last time. I, I know we talked about Stamkos doing 60, but. You know, I was in the building last night when the Leafs lost to Detroit and Austin scored 69. And everybody was just so hoping that they would be part of history, right? <laughs> yeah. um, being in that building, it did not happen. But as I told you off air before, I'm heading down to Florida tomorrow to uh, to see the final two games of Tampa Bay, of which the Leafs play on Wednesday. And 
you know, Austin plays in Florida Tuesday and then in Tampa Wednesday. So hopefully records uh, or or history is achieved with him scoring in one of those two games. Uh, it'll be a treat to maybe be a part of that watching it because it's, uh, it's something special, no doubt. Yeah. All right. But, you know, further to that, when you mentioned Gary Lehman and Doug Gilmore and, you know, prior to even Austin breaking Ricky Vibes' record of 54 when he mm-hmm. did that. So yeah. uh, you think about the Leafs' history and the long-standing history of our, over 100-plus years, and there were only three 50-goal scorers, and that would have been Vive, Andrew Chuck, and Lehman, and I would have played with all three of those guys. Right. So you're kind of looking sure. at that, and you're going – Man, don't you think the Leafs should have had more 50 goal guys uh, yeah. uh, only playing in the generation that I had played in uh, for that short period of time? But nonetheless, um, yeah, it's a, it's an awesome achievement. And, and playing with guys that break records, uh, it doesn't diminish the fact that they, you know, accomplish these things because, you know, when Gary scored his 50th goal and having assisted on it, um, I remind him that. Yeah, I got 50 assists, and you had scored 51 goals, but I think I assisted on 50 of your 51. So you would have never have gotten 50 without me. Of yeah. course, of course. So what what does it kind of feel like in the room, though, mm-hmm. when, like, a guy does that, like, immediately yeah. after? Like, what's that kind of like? Yeah, well, it, it – obviously, the guys are talking about it all the time, and, you know, you can only imagine inside the dressing room. I mean, guys are kibitzing in practice, and – and, and you realize that it's something that is going to happen. And so there's, I'm sure, lighthearted conversation. The guys understand on the bench and on the ice. Like, they even watch it on the power play that they're looking to get it to Austin. Like, I don't think they're changing things up because he's such a big part of their power play anyways. But, mm-hmm. you know, that that's obviously one of the situations in a game where that could possibly become a reality because – It's not just the power play, but Austin's going to get good looks on the power play. I mean, he scored number 69 on the power play, albeit from a different side of the ice. But, um, you know, I think he had 10 shots on net last night. He rang a crossbar. So, um, you know, when you play with guys like that, I think it almost becomes routine in some ways because you just know that it's going to happen. And uh, I don't, I don't necessarily think you take it for granted, but you know, you do understand the the magnitude of of what it's like to play with guys that have such special abilities and skill. And then, you know, going back to when Dougie Gilmore broke Daryl Sittler's record that year, when he won the Selkie Trophy as well. Um, you know, arguably in playing in that generation with Gretzky and Lemieux and Iserman and. You know, those were iconic players, but Dougie, those two years, I would say was the best player in the NHL um, because he played a 200-foot game. And not only did he play at both ends of the ice, kill penalties, power play, but he broke that record of Daryl Sittler. That was a, a special season. I'm not, you're not going to get any argument from, uh, from me in particular there. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to that 93 Leafs team that you were part of. And you were part of a formidable checking line with Bill Berg and Peter Zezel. Um, do you think that having a true shutdown line is kind of a lost art in today's NHL? Or, you know, how have you seen it sort of evolved in today's game? Yeah, you know, that that is a great question because I know that uh, as teams and every team does it differently, right? Like every team builds their team and constructs them. And we've gone into a uh, a style of play that is based on speed and skill. Like that is just the nature of the way the game is played today. Uh, the players in my generation were bigger. We were hooking, we were holding. I mean, now you got to be able to skate and you have to have skill. And the smaller player is now able to play in today's game, where as in, you know, except for guys like Dougie Gilmore, I mean, you had to fight through the hooking and the holding and the big player. I mean, sometimes when you watch those old highlights, you can't believe what we got away with, right? Like, you, I mean, sometimes you could watch, you know, the, the old footage of that series that we had, say, with L.A., or you watch the Red Wing series, and it was exciting hockey, and it was back and forth, 
And it almost seemed as though, even though we were the checking line, it seems like guys couldn't coat, check their coats at the time. You know, like to, <laughs> the, the way the progression of the game and, and defensive schemes have have been implemented. Um, and yet, um, yeah, we had that formidable third line checking assignment that Pat Burns was not afraid to put us out against, you know, the other team's top lines and then allow Dougie's line or, um, you know, if it was John Cullen at the time or whatever the second line would have been, you know, because Burnsy would always change up yeah. uh, the wingers with Dougie. You know, sometimes yeah. it'd be Boroshevsky and Clark. Sometimes it'd be Anderchuk. Glenn Anderson would get a turn there. So we knew who the top two lines were, but we also felt very much uh, a big part of, of our reasonable success as a checking line. And so you look at teams and, and I know people often, you know, they'll stop you and say, Oh man, we haven't had a checking line. And since your line, and, <laughs> and it's almost in some ways a shame or a crime that we're sitting here, what, 31 years later, 30 mm -hmm. years later, still talking about the relative success that we had going to the Stanley cup semifinals close to getting to the finals being robbed by Kerry <laughs> Fraser. Yeah. And uh, I think there was a conspiracy back then. You know, if you believe in conspiracy theories, I think it was out for us back then. But, um, you know, nonetheless, I do still see some teams that do um, uh, have a third line checking role mentality. I mean, if you remember when Tampa Bay won their first cup, a couple of, not, not the one in, with Andrew Chuck back in 2004, but in in recent years, I mean, you had Yanni Gordy with Coleman right. and Barkley Goodrow. I mean, mm -hmm. that was they were a huge part of that winning winning that Stanley Cup. I mean, they were strong, you know they were heavy, even though Gordy was on the slight side, but he he competed hard. Uh, Goodrow checked well. Coleman was a was a heavy body, and so yeah, they were a checking line that produced as well. So um, you know, you look at you know, maybe another team that has a perfect C3. Like we like to kind of categorize them by C1, C2, C3, C4 on teams. And traditionally your C3 would be and, and form a checking role. Um, and yet C3s today are, are, are often called upon to also score. So, um, you know, you can only put so many guys out on power plays. And so your bottom six get traditionally – um, they're, they're tagged as your role guys. And yeah, if you can build a checking line that you can free up one of your other two top scoring lines, then that only enhances and helps your team. And, and I even think back, you know, to the Leafs with when David Camp is on your C3, like you put Yarncroft over there. Um, and I don't know who else they would put on their, on the left wing, but, you know, that could be a pretty good checking line for you where I know Sheldon Keefe is not afraid to play a guy like David Kampf against any other team's top centers. He might, he's not going to produce. Like, that's one thing we know David is not going to do. Like, even a couple of years ago, he did score a couple of goals in the playoffs, if you remember. Like, mm -hmm. those were yeah. important goals for him, but but that's not really his role and uh, and it's really hard to find, you know, two-way guys that can contribute, you know, offensively on your third line as well as defend well, kill penalties. Um, I think we've gotten away from that traditional third line that, you know, was the generation that I had been a part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and especially too, like Peter Zezel also with the face-off yeah. specialist. There are yeah. some because he would. Yeah. We always, as fans, we were sitting up in the crowd there but, at Maple Leaf Gardens. We we always mm -hmm. wanted. We knew Peter Zezel was going to take that important, all the important draws like that, right? So, yeah, and, and, yeah, and also, and also, what you have to remember, like like Peter's role, and and it's kind of funny how our our um, line evolved that year with Pat is that. You know, Peter came from the Flyers, if you remember, and yeah. he was on a scoring line. Like, he scored over 30 goals with – he played with Prop and Kerr, you know, Timmy Kerr and Brian Prop. Like, mm -hmm. so it was not like he was a slouch when it came to contributing offensively. <laughs> but, you know, Burns, he looked at our lineup and said to us, like, could you guys play a certain role? And, of course, you mentioned the fact that Zez was very good at, at, at uh, taking face-offs. Well – I remember Burnsy coming up to me and I had never played right wing. 
And I know Berge played left wing, and he asked me, do you, "Can you play? Have you played right wing before?" <laughs> and what do you think I told him? I go, "Of course, I've played right wing before. <laughs> <laughs> I had never played right wing my whole career, but but uh, I had played with Steve Larmer in junior, and Steve was a left handed shot that played the right side. So um, you know, playing your whole life as a kid and playing you know a good part of your pro career on the left side, playing left wing." I mean, it was an early adjustment, but like, it doesn't change your role. Like if, if you understand the game, you can check. Um, it is a slight adjustment playing on your opposite side, but nothing really does change. Some guys can't make the adjustment. And I also think that there are defensemen. I think it's even harder for defensemen when you ask a left-handed shot to go play the right side. That's not a natural thing for them to do. Um, TJ Brody can do it with the Maple Leafs, and now you're seeing Brian McCabe play the right side. And so some guys make the adjustment they can do, and other guys can't. But, um, you know, nonetheless, in our case, uh, we fooled Pat, and he used us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about, um, I guess, the spotlight of Toronto mm. um, and how yeah. it apparently it's so hard for players to deal with the media and just being a Toronto Maple Leaf. Um, and being a former Leaf player and also having the experience on the media side, we wanted to get mm -hmm. your thoughts on um, on this. On like, Do you think the Toronto spotlight is so much different than any other Canadian market Like for players to that they make such a big deal of this? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it certainly is. I mean, both Montreal and Toronto, I think, stand apart from the rest of the NHL. I mean, the spotlight, I, I think Vancouver is tough on their players. Um, okay. there, there can be very, very critical in some ways. I'm surprised, you know, to that degree, but, you know, the emphasis of being a Canadian, uh, hockey player or, you know, being a player on, in a Canadian market is, is, is really special. It, it really is. And when you talk about a rich tradition of being a Maple Leaf, it, it is not for everyone. Um, you know, because, like you can hide in Tampa Bay, you can hide in Los Angeles. When I played with the Rangers, I mean, you could go to the rink and nobody knows you, right? Like you could go out to a restaurant, nobody knows you. Even you in can't New York, go in New yeah, York, even in really? New York. Well, wow. come on, you know, there's millions of people yeah. in New York. Yeah, people I guess that's do true. recognize you, but but there are so many other. There's tourists. There's there's you know there's lots of people that wouldn't have any idea who you are, mm -hmm. but. You could be a fourth line player in the Maple Leafs and people will know who you are in this city. Um, it just goes with the territory. Now things have changed with social media, right? Like the phones, guys are afraid to go to the bars because of pictures and, you know, who knows? There's all sorts of those types of things, but there's, there's added pressure in this market. And, and I think there's been more added pressure because of the Leafs inability these last 20 years now right like we're going to you know 2005 when the cap was introduced like the Leafs have gotten out of the first round once right mm -hmm. and that was last year yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. you know when you talk about the fact that the Leafs have had like let's face it they, they have an entertaining team like fans should be proud of the Maple Leafs and the product that they get to go and watch but I hear the narrative on the other side of things is that as soon as things, you know, they lose a game or two or whatever, or they look at this team and it's like, ah, they're out. They're going to be out early again. They're going to be out early again. Right. I just, and I just I, heard that last night on yeah. Twitter. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I, yeah. And I yeah. think that for the player, like you cannot, um, I don't think you could, you could do the best that you can not to pay attention to it, but these guys are on their phones. They read they read the noise and stuff. And I know the team does its best to tell the players, like, do yourself a favor and don't go on social media because that can really truly affect you mentally in your performance. Because we didn't have that when we played, right? But I remember, like, and this was before the Pat Burns days, but when young players like Vincent Danfoos and Daniel Marois were playing mm -hmm. and they would come in the dressing room. I'd see them reading the Toronto sun in the morning. And, and they were like, they were like captured by everything that was said about them positively and negatively. And you could see that 
these guys, it's not good for them. It's not mm-hmm. good to listen to all that narrative. But um, as much as the media is for the Maple Leafs here, I, I think the natural part of it, and having been on the other side, as you guys have mentioned already, mm-hmm. um, in doing Leaf TV or doing stuff on the score with Gordy Stellick, I, I think there's always a natural um, uh, ability, I think, to criticize or look at the faults uh, as equal, right? And when things don't go well, I mean, it's easy to pile on, right? Like, I, I think there are some in the media that enjoy um, the negativity rather than the positivity, and I think that that's unique in certain areas. I see it happen in Montreal, La Presse. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the French version, but they could be so, so hard on their players. And you open up that La Presse, like how many pages in today, like how many people read the newspaper today and there's like eight pages of Montreal Canadian stuff there, right? So <laughs> these are these are tough play, yeah. places to play and you've got to be a special person to embrace mm-hmm. it. But I love playing here and Dougie loved it. Wendell loved it. I mean, all of yeah. these guys that are iconic Leafs, they ate it up because it was such a great place to play. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we think it's a great place. Yeah. We think so too. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, and 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 now for the guys in 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 a specific, I, I would specifically talk to about Mitch Marner, right? And you know, William Nylander, I think, made some strides last year in producing in the playoffs, but the focus really is on a guy like Mitch. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like he's one of their their top players. Um, and, and until he can figure it out in postseason, how to get past the verbal abuse of Brad Marchand or the heaviness and how the game does change because it looks like they'll get Florida and Florida, I think surprised the Leafs last year, but no team wins without its best players producing it, You, you go back in the history of Stanley cups, like who's, yeah, you need your foot soldiers in that they, it, it's a team game, but your best players have to be their best players in order for you to succeed. And uh, that certainly lies on the shoulders of their top guys. And Mm -hmm. that's Mitch and that's Austin and that's Willie. And that's the fab five, you know, for, Mm -hmm. for what we've been talking about for these last many years. Yeah. I can't say it better than that. That's for sure. We've been, we've been saying that for a few years, like you said. Yeah. 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 Anyways, um, let's switch gears and and why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing uh, as a pro okay. scout with LA right now? Yeah, so I've been on the pro scouting staff now with the Kings for nine years, and you know if you would have asked me, and this almost comes back full circle because you know I I look back on '93 and us losing to Rob Blake and Luke Robitaille and mm-hmm. you know Nelson Emerson and these guys, and they were on that team, and now I'm working with them, right? Like. <laughs> and and I did not play for the LA Kings. So, you know, getting that opportunity when I got approached in 2015 after they won two Stanley Cups, I mean, I wasn't campaigning for a job in scouting. I just got approached. I was, you know, happy to do the stuff with Gordy and, you know, life was good here. So, um, but it really got my juices flowing because, you know, I started thinking about it. I went to LA. Um, they told me what the job entailed. And so I got really intrigued by it and, you know, they offered me a two year contract and I figured, well, if I'm not good at it or it doesn't work out or, or whatever, then at least I know I would have tried, you know, like, because Mm -hmm. being part of a team is one thing that you really miss. Like once you retire, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody talks about the camaraderie, the players, the dress room, the road trips, like, all of those things are, are really something you miss as a player. So to get back involved in a team uh, and with the possibility, even though you play a small role in pro scouting, um, it still is cool. You, you feel a part of the team. I mean, Blakey and uh, the management team, Luke Robitaille, I mean, those guys are such awesome guys to work for because they get it. You know, they played the game at a high level. And what I like about being part of the Kings is that none of those guys, like we all, we're all born with egos, right? Like you wouldn't be a pro athlete if you didn't have some self-confidence or an ego in there somehow. But yet everybody there is so even keeled 
Um, and you're talking about Hall of Fame players and mm-hmm. cup winners, right? Mm-hmm. And and yet uh, everybody's treated equal. Um, they listen. You know, we're built on trying to do the same thing the Leafs are trying to do. So it's kind of funny that I'm here and my mom, you know, she calls me almost after every Leaf game. And she's she's a Ukrainian woman. She goes, hey, Mark, so did you <laughs> see the Maple Leafs last <laughs> night? And and she would she would come up with these you know euphemisms or whatever yeah. and say some funny things and she would say, well the hurricanes came in the town and they blew the maple leaves away <laughs> you know she would say something funny like that or or temp or the leaves were hit with lightning last night and I go <laughs> I go mom mom I, I I get it I get it you go you know I work with another team I I do have a care for the maple leaves but I've got my own team to worry about. Oh, she goes, oh, Mark, please don't say that. They were so good to you, you know, <laughs> which they were, which they were. But but it's, it, you know, it, it's interesting being a former player in this city. And because there's some of us that had played for the Maple Leafs. Mike Eastwood works for Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Alan McCauley works for Philadelphia. Um, Jay McClement works for Pittsburgh. So there's guys in the game that you know, did their best to win a cup for the Maple Leafs, but work for other organizations. I skate with Gary Roberts on Monday mornings, and he does um, development for his friend Ronnie Francis with the Kraken, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at guys that played the game, you always kind of remember them as as Maple Leafs, right? But Mm -hmm. we're, we're all now, well, a good part of us are working for different organizations and and for others, like my friends, like my phone blows up almost every night regarding the Leafs. <laughs> and I say, guys, you know, I do care, but I do work for somebody else. And I've got <laughs> nine other teams to worry about besides the May Police. But, no, it's, it is it is fun to be a part of the job and, and being a pro scout. I mean, w- our job is specifically for trades and free agency. So, right. um you know, guys that we have acquired through trades like Kevin Fiala or Victor Arvidsson or, um, you know, Gavrikov, those are part of trades, Pierre-Luc Dubois. Uh, on the UFA side, that would be us looking and, you know, rating and saying, okay, UFA centers, uh, where does Phil Deneau place on our priority list? And obviously we signed Phil, and he's been a great mm-hmm. addition to our team. But that's where our job comes in mm-hmm. for management is they say, okay, order all the UFA centers because we're looking for a centerman this year. And there's a lot of variables with money and all that come into play. But they have uh, they have really do trust our judgment and our value and, um, you know, what we push for players that we think would make good fits for our team. And, mm-hmm. know what, you know, every other team is the same way. They do the same thing. Maple Leaf scouts are doing the same thing when they – when Brad Tree Living looked at trade deadline, said, what kind of players do we need to add to this team? They went out and got Edmondson, right? They added a little bit of jam and bite on their back end. They went out and got Ryan Reeves in the summertime because I think they recognize that an ingredient that this team does need when you play heavy teams like Boston or Florida. So there you go. There's where your pro, pro staff come into play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's... Uh... Definitely, like you obviously know that uh, trade deadline is like, and mm-hmm. uh, and the uh, free agent frenzy. Those yeah, are like right. special holidays here, right? So <laughs> it's obviously a really important job that you do, and yeah. it also sounds to me like your mom is like the original ladies talking leaf leaves. Yeah. So <laughs> oh, she, oh yeah, she is. Oh, she goes. Oh, so yeah, and she'll say, "Oh, Austin, I see Austin's getting closer." <laughs> yeah, so. So, yeah, you know, like you you think of a Ukrainian immigrant woman who came to Canada in the 50s, had no clue about hockey. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, what turned it around for her is, well, she married in the early, well, she married in 1960. Uh, If you're a Canadian man, I mean, you know, with all due respect to girls, but it's like you're into hockey on a Saturday night. You know, mm-hmm. my mom was upset at my dad because it was hockey night in Canada on a Saturday <laughs> night. But then Team Canada rolled around in 72. My grandparents got into that because they were part of the, you know, the Iron Curtain. Ukraine was part of Russia. So they got into hockey. My mom got into hockey. I started playing hockey. And then, you know, instantaneously, 
you know, how, how can you as a, a mom or dad not get behind your son? And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I mean, I got drafted by Detroit. I played with the Rangers, but when I got traded here to Toronto, I mean, that was like the <laughs> epiphany for my mom, you know, because again, it takes you back to your childhood, right? Riding the subway, going down to Maple Leaf Gardens and watching those guys as a starstruck kid, right? Watching Lanny and Boria and Daryl and, you know, Davey Keon and Palmateer, and then all of a sudden, you're one of those guys, and you're playing against those guys, and now you become mm-hmm. a Maple Leaf and you put that jersey. I tell you, like, I had played six or seven years in the NHL before I got traded to the Leafs, and I remember my first game because I played in New York the night before, I got a call from Phil Esposito that next morning telling me I'd been traded to the Maple Leafs, and I had to get on a plane and play that night in another uniform within 24 hours, and it happened to be the Maple Leaf one. And in doing so, I was nervous. I was nervous. Like, it was like in front of my home hometown. But, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a dream come true. Well, Mark, uh, this has been incredible. We thank you Mm. so much for coming on with us and giving your time. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say. We can, we can talk at least for you you for like a lot longer. So no, no, we certainly can. I love talking (laughs) hockey and I love, I love the fact that, you know, how women's hockey has exploded girls hockey. I mean, my girls, I said, Hey, would you like to play hockey? And I don't know if they were shy or, you know, one, one was more academic and in the books. My other, my youngest one was more of an athlete, but you know, she never did. Um, but yet it, it's great to see the girls, the, the game grow with women's hockey. And, and now to see that, uh, you know, it carries on in the media circles. I mean, you know, yeah. women covered hockey back when I played, but it's taken on a whole nother level. And it's uh, just cool to be a part of this with you girls. Well, thank you so much. And Thanks, we look yeah. forward to talking to you again in the future. My pleasure. Have, have right. a great day. Yeah. Thanks, girls. Thanks again to Mark Osborne for taking the time to come on the show and being a, a part of our 100th episode. It was uh, amazing to have him on and um, just to do with, as a player, the perspective that he gives, being in the room. And um, and then also, obviously, all those brought back a lot of fan moments for uh, for both of us, I know, for from those 93, 94 runs. So it was fantastic to have him on, and we thank him so much. Yeah. And he, um, he's, he's just got this really incredible perspective because like, like we said, he's got the media side, player side, which is really important, incredible to get. And also, uh, his perspective now as a scout, um, that was actually really, really interesting. And he covers uh, the teams in our Atlantic division. So, um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to talk to him again in, in the future sometime. He is the first former player we've had on, so we are super grateful um, that he was able to join us. Yeah, so hopefully other former players will watch and they'll want to come on to mm-hmm. join yes, Ladies Talking Blues too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So before we want, we go, we want to thank you, our listeners and followers on YouTube and social media for listening and watching our show. It's our fifth season and now a hundred episodes. So we can't really believe that it's, we've gone this, this far already. And of course we wouldn't have been able to do it without all of you who, who listen to us and follow us. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been, it's been a great ride. And, uh, Thankfully, still thought of this show uh, way back in uh, to get to get me into this. And uh, yeah, it's but like you said, it's listeners that uh, and the followers on social media that uh, that that keep us going. So Mm -hmm. thank you so much. Well, we love talking Leafs and we love keeping the conversation going with with Leafs Nation. So, yeah. And don't forget, Leafs Nation, we are going weekly for the playoffs. So the best way not to miss an episode is to hit that follow button wherever you listen to us, uh, Apple, Spotify, uh, YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Uh, at the same time, please consider leaving us a rating or a review. It's so easy on Apple or Spotify, and it's important for our show to get recognized as a source for Leafs content. And we thank you for taking the time. 
And another way to help us out is by visiting our Ko-fi page at ko-fi.com. You can follow us there. And if you choose to, you can support us by buying us a coffee. Any donation goes towards helping us produce the show and making it even better for you. You can find the link to our Ko-fi page on our show notes or in any of our social media profile pages. And as always, we want to thank our healthcare workers and our first responders for everything that they do. We thank you, as always, for listening and watching Ladies Talking Leafs presented by Bet Online. See you in the playoffs, folks. Go, go Leafs, Leafs, go! Go Do you believe?